The thesis of the God's Not Dead film series is that Christians and Christianity are under siege in America, and that the way to fight back is through use and misuse of the First Amendment, primarily in academic settings. In the first film, a college freshman named Josh out-debates his impossibly antagonistic, strawman atheist philosophy professor on the subject of the existence of God. The professor is violently killed at the end and dies, but not before becoming a last-minute, born-again Christian. What happened here tonight is a cause for celebration. In the second film, a high school teacher named Grace ends up in court after answering a student's question about Jesus. She wins the case, defeating the villainous ACLU lawyer, even though the ACLU would probably be the one to take Grace's case in the real world. In the third film, the historic church on a public university campus is vandalized, and a man is killed. What happened here tonight is a cause for celebration. The university decides that this is a good time to remove the church and put up the long-awaited student center in its place. Dave, the pastor, finds this unacceptable and sees it as God being removed from the lives of Americans. In case you hadn't noticed, two out of three of these narratives are not about God being dead or the existence of a creator, and all three deal more heavily with the erroneous idea of Christian persecution in my country. These movies aren't about God. They're about America. This is what our country has come to. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness begins with Pastor Dave arrested for not turning over his sermons to the authorities. He is immediately released because this is actually unconstitutional. All three God's Not Dead movies tell us the story of persecuted Christians in America. It provides a false narrative to its target audience that the Christian majority in America, roughly 75%, is the real marginalized group and that other groups who have no power actually do have all the power. In sociology, the term majority does not always refer to a numerical majority. Rather, it refers to the group that has power. In the case of Christians in America, it is both numerical and a case of power and privilege. Okay, this next bit is going to be so 101 that it shouldn't even need to be said, but for the audience of God's Not Dead, apparently it does. A dominant group, whether in the numerical majority or not, holds privileges that the minority does not. Usually some combination of social status, access to education, wealth, and political power. Obvious examples include disproportionate policing of racial minorities in America, housing discrimination due to race, and other things that the racial majority in America, white people, do not face. The majority, or dominant group, passively receives privileges that minorities, or the subordinate group, do not. Again, this is super obvious that some people are treated differently than others, but you would not believe the defensiveness of the majority about this. In America, the majority religious group is Christianity, making up roughly 75% of America. This supermajority grants Christians social status and political power that minority religions and the non-religious do not possess. In God's Not Dead, however, Christians are portrayed as the oppressed class, the subordinate group, and an actual bona fide minority group, atheists, are portrayed as having greater social status and political power, two of the features that a minority does not actually possess. It's backwards, but it's what many Christians genuinely believe is the case in the real world. In reality, obviously Christians do not face nearly as many hate crimes as religious minorities, they do not get labeled terrorists simply for existing, and they do not face challenges being elected into public office. The majority enjoys privileges that the minority does not. Now, that does not mean white Americans or Christian Americans do not have problems, because everyone has problems. Everyone gets laid off or has their car break down sooner or later, but their problems are not the result of being white or being Christian. 
Nobody is denied housing as a direct consequence of being white in America. Nobody is unelectable for public office as a direct consequence of being Christian in America. Every American president has either been a Christian or, in the early days, a deist, someone who still believes in God. Heaven help you if you're an atheist seeking public office. The year before the last presidential election, almost half of Americans said that they would outright refuse to vote for an atheist even if they were nominated by their chosen party. Among Protestants, the largest form of Christianity in America, it's more than half. Meaning, in order for an atheist to become president, they would have to capture literally every other demographic and every stray voter in the country who didn't immediately dismiss them sight unseen, including an inordinate amount of voters from the opposing party. Atheists have no real power in America due to their limited numbers and lack of representation in government. There are no self-identified atheists in Congress anymore, and only one listed as unaffiliated. Only about 3% of Americans openly identify as atheists, but tell that to these movies. God's Not Dead showcases atheism as an enemy that is both incredibly strong and incredibly weak. Strong because it has the backing of evil, but weak because it is opposed to God. The film wants us to believe that the minority religions and secular minority in America help each other through a secret web of mutual assistance. They are crafty, and control the media. This feeds into real-world fears among socially conservative Christians in America that they, as the majority religion, face comparable or even worse discrimination than minority religions. Of course, that is not how power structures work. Society generally establishes systemic power in the majority. It does not have to be codified in law, though. Simply by a majority existing, social attitudes and social interaction favors said majority. The creators of films like God's Not Dead create a fiction in which Christians, the majority in both senses of the word in America, are the marginalized group. This is a misconception that is unfortunately widespread and exists outside of the confines of Christian exploitation films. A 2016 poll by the Public Religion Research Institute states that nearly half of Americans believe that discrimination against Christians in America is as common as discrimination against African Americans and other minorities. Among Christians, that belief is greater than half. In truth, attitudes toward minority religions in America are much worse. For example, attitudes toward Muslims in America are worse and disprove the idea that Christians are discriminated against as much as or more than religious minorities. Most Americans still believe Islam is, and this is a quote here, at odds with American values and way of life. That includes white evangelical Protestants, often thought to be the target demographic of God's Not Dead. Here are some examples of cases of so-called Christian persecution that God's Not Dead wants us to believe is happening in America. We know that these movies want us to learn about these cases because they literally put them in the end credits. Let's examine them. State of Washington v. Arlene's Flowers The state of Washington and a same-sex couple sued a florist because said florist discriminated against them on the basis of their sexuality. This is not Christian persecution. It is persecution of homosexuals. Cryer v. Klein A same-sex couple sued a cake artist and her business for discriminating against them on the basis of their sexuality. Again, not Christian persecution. Persecution of homosexuals. Cochran v. City of Atlanta The fire chief of Atlanta sued the city after it fired him for expressing his religious beliefs about marriage in a book he wrote. Now, that's the version God's Not Dead wants you to hear, but he was actually fired for proselytizing on the job, handing out copies of his book to his subordinates who did not ask for it, and creating a bad working environment. Keaton v. Anderson Wiley A counseling student sued a university for what she believed was a violation of her religious freedom. In reality, she was counseling gay people to go to conversion therapy, which is illegal in many states and widely understood to be both incredibly harmful by the psychiatric profession and outright quackery as well. 
The rest are a series of cases about companies who are mandated to provide proper health care to their employees, which includes contraception, and more and more and more anti-gay discrimination and demonization masquerading as religious freedom. As I was writing this, a Christian anti-LGBT hate group called the Alliance Defending Freedom has appealed a case to the Supreme Court which would allow employers to fire employees based purely on the basis of being transgender. And they call this freedom. Now, some Christians argue that they should be able to deny service to any group or class of people, but historically that leads to creating second-class citizens. This is not religious freedom. It is freedom to reinstitute a new form of segregation. If these businesses refused to perform services for an African-American couple, we would call them bigots. But because they don't want to serve a gay couple, they think they are being discriminated against instead. In short, when you are accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness offers a backdrop for a debate about the role of Christian faith in the modern political climate and, as seen in previous offerings, its role in academia. It tells us that ranting Facebook commenters might have a good point, but more disturbing is the idea that the young white male who commits violence against the church only did so because of a broken heart. That is dangerous rhetoric surrounding school shooters at the moment. Rather than tackling the systemic problems in our society and our laws that allow such violence, it is blamed on something abstract like anger and heartache that cannot be dealt with. NRA spokesperson Dana Lash makes a cameo in the film interviewing the protagonist. So the messaging here is frightening to say the least. One antagonist in the film is clearly modeled after a Black Lives Matter protester, which is noticeably problematic and speaks to the film's inherent right-wing politics and false equivalencies. The best and worst part of the film comes when Dave is in a predominantly black church complaining about his problems, and the Reverend says, Brother, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a black preacher in the Deep South. I could build you a church with all the bricks been thrown through my windows. In this moment, and a couple others in the film, it almost seems like A Light in Darkness is reevaluating the first two films, but in the end, A Light in Darkness is no different. It cannot begin to imagine what sacrifice and persecution really looks like, and because of this, it stretches the truth. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness opens with Dave in jail for not surrendering his sermons and the media hounding him. God's Not Dead is citing the real case in which this was attempted but not actually followed through. In the real world, when the government attempted to do this, the ACLU that God's Not Dead hates so much actually supported the church's rights. Also, nobody has tried the same thing again. It is settled law, and the Constitution is the Constitution. But that is unimportant to God's Not Dead because the implication that it could happen is enough. The prior movie had Grace in court over saying Jesus in her classroom even though the manner in which she said it did not violate church and state separation, school prayer guidelines, or the law, and no such case exists. But again, this is unimportant to God's Not Dead because the implication that it could happen needs to be enough for the audience. And the first movie is just a Facebook anecdote that absolutely did not happen. Once more, does not matter to God's Not Dead. These films are fiction, yes, but the target audience is meant to believe that similar cases are happening all the time, citing half-truth court cases. Christian exploitation movies do not teach you to think for yourself, and it does not give you new ideas that you might not have considered. Instead, they instruct Christians what to think, how to behave, and how to confront those whose beliefs are different from their own. The first God's Not Dead film is literally a debate primer designed to both inform Christians how to shut down atheists and preach misconceptions and myths about atheists in general. These films treat Christians like children or uneducated. The Bible is meant to leave a lot of room for its readers to think, listen, and respond, which is owed a lot to its Jewish roots. Christ teaches us humility. Christian exploitation films have no such humility.
If God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness has a central theme, a core message it is trying to impart on its target demographic, it is that of a false civility that is possessed by American Christians, but lacking in those who are not. In the film, a young man, perhaps having too much to drink and unhappy with his Christian girlfriend needing space from him, throws something into the window of a local church. Some Rube Goldberg happenstance later, a man is killed in a church fire. Over and over, the film tells us that anger at the church is poisonous and that civility must be reached between both sides. The film prefers not to broach the legitimate complaints against the influence of the Christian church in American life, politics, and academia, and instead blame the conflict on an amorphous anger. In the end, Pastor Dave martyrs himself for the cause of this false unity, this phony civility. He gives up his church, but really he simply builds a new one, suggesting that he actually gave up nothing. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness does not address the concerns that non-Christians have. Demands for civility function primarily to stifle the frustrations, outcries, protests, and declarations of grievances of those currently facing real harm. The oppressed, the marginalized, the minority. Calls for civility are a smokescreen to allow those in power to continue unabated. Such civility, a neutrality of both speech and action, is more useful to those currently enjoying the fruits of the status quo than it is useful to those hoping to effect change or bring attention to their oppression. And those calling for civility definitely know this. It's a tactic to suppress protest and to falsely claim that both sides share equal blame for the unequal relationship between majority and minority. Many arguments for this false civility that protects the status quo invokes the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., a great Christian leader. They weaponize King and show his nonviolent protest as a platonic ideal. King is the exemplar for the so-called right way for abused and oppressed minorities in the country to protest and effect change. God's Not Dead 2 also used King by name as a means of talking down to one of the film's only African American characters. This nonviolent, inoffensive civil rights activism of King, used to scold and finger wag minorities, is actually a completely false image. Their actions were militant and confrontational. Such protests may have been nonviolent, but in order for change to occur, laws had to be broken. King himself went to jail dozens of times. Breaking the law was necessary because the civility of working within the system and the status quo provides few outlets for effecting nationwide change on such a massive scale. King's tactics were not widely considered civil at the time, and public opinion polls showed whites generally believed black protesters were agitators and were disrupting public order. When God's Not Dead and contemporary politicians call for civility and unity, it's important to understand motivation. Civility and unity are unassailable words. They always carry an inherent positive connotation, and because of this, calls for civility and unity from the mouths of those in power, the oppressors, the majority, can be said without much public outcry. But the motivation for these calls are not benign. It's an attempt to protect the status quo and those who benefit from it from the completely understandable anger and frustration of those it harms. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness uses a violent act as its catalyst to discuss the civility it demands of people. It uses an unconscionable act, burning down a church and killing a pastor, to make its point through its own fiction. But then, in the film, when people do protest peacefully, even more peacefully than King, Pastor Dave insists that they put down their protest signs. See, that is the tactic of those calling for an end to violent protests. Violence is decried, and those to whom the violence is a response say that this is an unacceptable level of protest. Then, a non-violent protest occurs, and this is deemed unacceptable as well. The goalposts keep moving until those who benefit from the status quo, be they white men, 
the rich, or conservative Christians can defame any protest no matter how civil, because civility is not what they want. The end of any protests or movements against them is what is wanted. The term civility is a reflection of majority-enforced social norms and attitudes, not a system of effective debate or a manner in which sides that are given unequal time and unequal treatment can debate equally. Those not in power do not have equal representation in Congress, and that requires those not in power to protest, to shout, and yes, to be angry sometimes. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness condemns any anger towards those in power, but the truth is anger is sometimes a necessary catalyst toward action, and that being true, a call to remove anger has the intended side effect of removing action. Let's use the target audience of the God's Not Dead films as an example, that being evangelical Christians. According to Pew Research, the majority, 55%, of evangelical Protestants believe homosexuality must be discouraged. It is also the position of evangelical Christian churches in America. Now, what someone holds in their hearts may be no business of others and might seem unimportant, but this has consequences outside of Sunday services. A majority of white evangelical Christians in America, 51%, support a business's right to discriminate against LGBT customers. Evangelical Christian politicians and their constituents help further discrimination against gay people and against trans people in everywhere from schools to bathrooms. Everything from women's reproductive rights to adoption rights are affected by the Christian majority in America, and specifically the evangelical Christian influence on the American political system. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness either misunderstands or purposefully obfuscates the meaning of tolerance. The talking head journalist character makes the same argument that the majority always makes. All of these college administrators, they go on and on and on about diversity and tolerance and inclusion, but yet when it's asked of them, they run you off of campus. Tolerance for the minority or the oppressed is a means in which to protect the minority or the oppressed. Tolerance for oppression itself is not an equal concept. Tolerance cannot be a mandate for how the oppressed must treat their oppressor because it's not tolerance, it's culpability in the actions of the oppressor. When Christian churches and Christian organizations in America can't do everything they want, that's not persecution. That's not intolerance. That's a mild amount of pushback against the overwhelming majority. We are under no obligation to be tolerant of intolerance. Being tolerant to intolerance does not create more tolerance. It creates more intolerance. This all might seem like a paradox, but it's one that's easily solved by not tolerating intolerance. When the central character of God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness, calls for an equal civility and equal tolerance on both sides of this argument, he is doing what those in power always do. He's drawing a false equivalency. Now, the character is portrayed as selfless and heroic in his sacrifice, but that's because the movie has created a debate for itself to win. Pastor Dave is the peacemaker, and the minority characters who question the church come to see him as a hero, because of course they do, because the movie wants us to believe that. The word civility, when used by those in power, is euphemistic for control. Here's an example that you probably know. Someone does or says something absolutely monstrous, is called out on it, and then he says, Hey, come on, don't be so divisive. Yeah, it's a ploy, and not a very good one. To King, it was the moderate who was the greatest threat to the minorities of America. People devoted to order more than justice. Those who preferred a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. 
So, when those who call for a false civility, whether they are politicians or the bad filmmakers behind a bad series of bad Christian exploitation films, use King as a bludgeon, they are, in fact, engaging in the behavior that he most famously denounced. So, let's go back to the end of the film here. This only makes sense on a superficial level, as if the problem is more about how we talk to each other than what we do. Bear in mind that the evangelical Christian base that watches these films believes it is being persecuted. Dave's argument about getting better sounds nice, but he doesn't address what that means. To the church, getting better means repealing same-sex marriage and reproductive rights. To his opponents, it means protecting those things. If two sides have opposite goals, the problem is not their tone of voice. An attempt by the majority to settle down an oppressed people is an attempt to stifle them, not make peace with them and give them what they want. A call to stop shouting plays differently to its audience. The movie doesn't take the arguments that contradict its own seriously, and doesn't ask the audience to either. What the film wants, and what the film tells the people, is that they really need to start listening to Christians. Dave's argument, meaning God's Not Dead's argument, is not in good faith. He may as well be paraphrasing Dana Lash's video where she ranted against protesters who shut down interstates and airports and, in her words, bully the law-abiding citizens. Dave's sermon is an unironic, so much for the tolerant left. God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness is far too weak to take on any such problems because they fly in the face of the persecution complex with which it wants to brand itself. Some will undoubtedly argue that there are bits and pieces of truth in the God's Not Dead films, but of course there are bits and pieces. That's how you get people to believe a lie. You sprinkle in a reference to something that happened, exaggerate it, or use it as the foundation to tell falsehoods. That's how lying on a large scale works. It's established by making the story believable and with just enough of it provable that the parts that are not true the parts that the liar really wants to sell you, are swallowed whole. Christians are not a persecuted class in America, but if you cite court cases that do exist and intentionally leave out the most important details, you can convince enough people of your lie. There's this scene in A Light in Darkness that encapsulates the entire cluelessness of the film series. Pastor Dave is talking to his estranged brother and says, Yes, some people have used violence in Jesus' name, but he wants to talk about the here and now, and he wants to talk about the good Christians. And that's the thing. God's Not Dead is made by people who think they're the good Christians. The ones that people should emulate. When atheists talk about problematic Christian teachings and actions, they must be talking about some... other Christians, right? Not us. Not we. The creators of God's Not Dead. And you know what? It's in this nonsense that movies and ideas contained within it are propagated. Is it ignorance that allows the creators of these films to believe this, or do they know the truth but knowingly lie to their audience? I can't rightly say which one is worse. Dave's liberal brother in the film claims Christians love to play the victim a way of preemptively justifying the film and defusing reasonable arguments on what the film is really about. And that's God's Not Dead, A Light in Darkness, and really the whole series. A complaint in favor of the majority in America about their perception of being pushed around and treated the ways minorities are actually treated. God's Not Dead is created under the presumption that Christians either already do or should believe it's propaganda. But my experience with Christians, and this is admittedly anecdotal, is that most of them either despise these films or are embarrassed that these films exist. My experience with Christians is that they are concerned that these films spread a dismal version of the faith that means so much to them. 
This is presumably the last God's Not Dead film, but it's not the last Christian exploitation film. So long as those with privilege want to maintain it, they will make themselves out to be the victims to distract from the actual victims. But considering the origins of this religion, I suppose a martyr complex was inevitable. Hi everyone, if you like what I do, please click on the orange Patreon link below. That's how this show happens. It's also the only way to request an episode. Also, please like, share, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next week.